Whether you're someone who wakes up every day and heads to the financial press to catch up on the latest headlines of that day, or whether you're someone who wakes up and heads to social media to check up what the latest gossip is, I'm sure we can all agree that all of us, one way or the other, are still facing some stories that are coming up about a possible global slowdown and about a possible slowdown in economies and in general business feeling around the world. And then to add to that, to bring it closer to home, I'm sure all of you who follow the markets in Africa have seen some of these terrible headlines that are showing us how markets are slowing down all over the continent and how halfway into the year right now, we only have three economies or three stock exchanges in Africa that have actually returned positive US dollar returns. I'm talking here of Nigeria, I'm talking of Rwanda, and closer to home to where I come from, I'm talking of Zambia. Just those three markets are the ones that have actually returned positive US dollar returns. And now, on top of that, my inbox is screaming, people asking me, well, the markets are crashing, Maro. Should we buy? Should we sell? But of course, as you guys who know, we have been following this YouTube channel for a while, know that I'm not a registered financial advisor, so I'm never going to tell people whether to buy or to sell. All that I'm going to tell people is what I am actually doing because that's what I created the YouTube channel for. And so in today's video, we are going to be talking about the fact that I am buying even though the markets are crashing. And some of you might have questions, why am I doing this? And this is exactly why I'm going to be explaining everything that you need to know about what I do in this video. It might be important on the outset for me to actually explain to you guys how I invest in all the markets that I actually invest in on the African continent because that's something that can be complicated if you actually don't have a method that's laid down that helps you keep the stress and helps you focus on what is the really important stuff and not all the noise that will be coming out from the news. Now, in the markets that I'm actually active in on the, on the African continent, what I do is that I actually have a fixed dollar amount that I invest within that market each and every month. What I mean by this is that, for example, if I decide that I want to invest on the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange $200 every month, that is exactly the amount that I send my broker every month for the 12 months of that year. What happens then is when my broker gets this money, they then go into the market and they start buying securities for me. You might want to ask, does that mean that every month I actually call my broker and say buy, you know, this type of security X or security Y? The answer is actually no, because I already have a portfolio that's open. And so what the broker does when they receive this money is they just choose among within the portfolio itself to say these are the stocks that we're going to add on to. Because those companies that are in the portfolio are companies that I already believe in. Those are companies that I've already made up my mind and say that I am willing to buy and hold these securities for the next 10, 20, or 30 years. As I always say, it's all about the long run. These are businesses that I believe are doing the right thing and that are run by management that is competent and management that is honest. And so whatever happens, I'm always willing to add more to my positions within my portfolio. Now, a natural question would actually be, how did I set up this system? How is it that someone can set up a system in which minimizes the amount of headaches and back and forth which I need to have with my broker? The first thing is actually that in the markets that I'm active in, what I did as soon as I opened my account in that market is I had a really long discussion with the broker who was going to be helping me with the account. We really wanted to understand, you know, the companies that are actually within that economy. It's a little bit easy, of course, for some economies that I already had knowledge about. You know, I had read a couple of stuff about the Zambian economy, the Botswana economy, and of course, on the Zimbabwe economy, which I actually grew up in. And so those conversations were a little bit faster within those markets. But some of the markets that I actually invest in that are further away from home, for example, on the Ghana Stock Exchange or the Nairobi Securities Exchange, what that means is I really need to have more discussions with the broker and really understand that market and really understand the companies and then form my own opinions on the companies and then we decide these are the 10, 12, or 15 companies that we're going to be investing in in this market. These are the companies that I believe in, and these are the companies that the broker themselves have told me the positives and the negatives about, and I'm willing to risk my capital to invest within these businesses. And so actually, after deciding and coming up with this list, this becomes a fixed list 
that we don't usually revise in a period of less than six months. We might sit down in six months or in a year and my broker says there's this company that we think has really changed the po to have a positive outlook. I look at their research that they would have written. I give my opinion on it. If I think that we should add it to the portfolio, we'll add it. But usually, it's really usually about just adding companies and not about removing because we would have done so much discernment within the strategy of coming up with these companies that it would actually be difficult for us to then backtrack on the companies that would have chosen in such a short period of time unless something extraordinary happens like an accounting scandal of some sort that the business might quickly go out of business. And so another point that is important here on this, on this segment is to realize that I actually have what we call the caps that we're willing to put in. Currently, in most markets, I have, you know, just a random number that I kept up with, 8.89%. That's just how much I'm willing to put money in one stock. And because, of course, if you don't put these limits, then you might end up having a case in which one stock is occupying 60% of the portfolio and the rest of the stocks are just occupying, you know, very small percentages, which, again, becomes a risky investment in case that 60% uh, company is the one that ends up going bust or going out of business. And so the caps that I put and tell the broker that as you you have the discretion to buy whenever I send money, but you always have to watch these limits to make sure that no stock is going through this uh, cap uh, rather and make sure that we're always keeping everything pretty much balanced and giving out the money almost to all the companies equally. Having explained my strategy, of course, you guys might want to ask, why is it that I actually think this strategy works? Why is it that I think that the strategy that I use is the best strategy to use in the markets, in the good times and in the bad times? The first reason, of course, is that I actually get discounts. You see, what is interesting about the stock market is many people usually do what I call lose their senses as, this, as soon as they come into this market. If you go to a grocery store and you realize that I don't know, due to some other reason, you know, maybe there's been, uh, you know, uh, so much supply of potatoes and there are so many potatoes. What are you going to do? You're probably going to buy more potatoes than you usually buy. This is better yet for even things that can last longer. If uh, tinned beans or tinned beef or tinned pork has actually gone down in price temporarily, you're likely to stock up more because you believe that you're getting a bargain. But usually when people are in the stock market, when the price of stocks start going down, people actually believe that they have to sell, which is kind of counterintuitive, as you, as you say. For the same dollar amount, using the strategy that I've used, if, I, if one share of stock was going for $20 and I'm willing to risk $100 every month, this means that I'll get five shares. But if it falls down and actually goes to $10 a share, then it means that I'll get 10 pieces of this business. This is something that is, I think, difficult for people to grasp, but it's also something that is very fundamental, which is the fact that I actually consider it to be good when the market is falling because then I can actually get more shares on the same dollar amount that I do send to my broker every month. And so because of that, I actually like this strategy because it actually helps me when the market is going down and when everyone else is fearful and using their emotions and I will actually be getting discounts on the businesses that I already believe in in the long term. The second reason why I believe this strategy is best is that it actually takes emotions out of investing. You see, people tend to use emotions when it comes to investing. They tend to wake up every day, open you know, their app or open their newspaper and they look at whether the stock market is going up, which is usually represented by green and everything, are going, everything is going on well on the screens and everyone is happy, or when it's going down and there's so much red and everyone is scared and everyone is coming on TV or on the newspaper writing op-eds or saying out stuff on television saying that people should probably stop buying because we need to really assess this market. But that's the time that people are getting tricked. That's the time in which the psychology is getting played. The red that we're seeing on the screens is essentially the ones that's rivaling up all these emotions within us and telling us sell, sell, sell. It's time to sell. But when you actually sell low and then you buy high, what you end up doing is you're losing money. The third reason, which is always something that is good to understand for everyone else, is that this is an easy method and it can be done without including the experts so much. As I've been explaining how I actually do this, the expert who I talked to to come up with this strategy in each and every market is the stockbroker who, of course, works for me. They want me to buy securities so that they can get their broker's commission. So I actually end up getting their research, reading it, forming my own opinions, of course, and then discussing with the broker to say, should we buy this? Should we not? 
after we have agreed on this portfolio of businesses that we're going to be buying, then we lock that. And then from there on, I don't have to consult any expert. This is different from me looking at the market each and every morning, seeing that one company has gone down, picking up the phone, calling my broker to say, I see this business is going down. Should we buy it? If we do it that way, then we're actually doing what other people call trading. We're trying to time the market. We're trying to make some little small dollars out here and there because of price movements. But that's not what I'm trying to do. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to buy businesses that I think have a value and businesses that I think are providing so many goods and services that are essential to the economy that they will be there within 20 and 30 years. When I explain my strategy to people, the question that I usually get is, then why do you do it for a basket of stocks and you don't actually do it for just one security? If there is a business that you really believe in, why is it that you don't actually buy just more of that business and have 100% of your portfolio within that business. And there is a reason for this. The reason for this is because, of course, even including all our discernments and all our practical thoughts and you know opinions that we have about the business and the business environment and the economy in general, we can never be so sure that putting all our money in one business is gonna help us in the long term. I usually give these people an example of a famous company that was called Nokia. It's still called Nokia. It's still there, I believe, and it's still trading. But at a certain point in this world, this company was so successful that anyone who had a mobile phone actually had a Nokia. In fact, one of my first phones that I used was actually a Nokia. I think it was a Nokia Asha or a Nokia C3. This was just a company that was making products that were almost everywhere, whether in the developing world or in the developed world, everyone was using Nokia. But as we all know what happened within history, Nokia actually went down. Nokia was muscled out of the smartphones business by you know different companies. Samsung came up, started making these amazing phones. Apple also came up as an offshoot, started making these amazing devices that everyone loves and everyone can't just get enough of. And so when you start to realize this, you begin to see that it is important for you to diversify your portfolio and for you to always reassess these businesses that you think will be there in 20 to 30 years. And because of that, I actually end up then having this basket of companies and of course being held by that limit that I that I put up, that cap that I put up of 8.89% to say we cannot have a business exceeding this within the portfolio because then we would never know how much money we would lose if we end up stocking 90% of the money in one business and that business just goes out of business. Now, Nokia is a case study of a business that was muscled out of a business and the competition actually took away the market share from it. But if we look at history, we would see that there are actually other businesses that surprisingly went out of business. It's a company that was called Enron, which was a big company, but that just went down to zero due to an accounting and corporate uh, scandal that hit the company. And so when you look at this, you never know what's actually happening behind the business. And because of that, I then broaden this basket of securities that I actually am willing to invest my money in and put in this 8.89% ceiling to say, we can never invest in more than this. But in a nutshell, of course, you begin to see how this is my strategy and how I've crafted it over time, especially to fit within the African context where we don't have a lot of ETFs and indexes that are trading and tracking the whole market. If there was an index or an ETF tracking the whole market, I'll probably just buy and put a lot of my money in this ETF or in this index. But because in most African contexts, we don't actually have a lot of index and ETFs, we end up choosing the businesses that we think we like, and then we create a portfolio that's constant and we constantly just invest and reinvest all this money within this portfolio. Before you put in your comments down below telling me what you think about this investing strategy and also telling me about the investing strategy that you're actually using, do make sure that you like the video and until next time, my name is Maro.